was a very, very special day. It was a special day in uh, history for uh, several reasons. Uh, last Tuesday was uh, uh, what day? It was what? Some said my birthday, and that's true. I was born on the 6th of June, which is also most commemorative for D-Day. And of course, uh, for a lot of people, it was an interesting day because it was the uh, sixth month, it was the sixth day, and it was 06666. You might have seen some of the articles in the newspaper. Moms, hell-bent, no 666 babies. Women asking doctors to induce them early so that their child would not be born on 666. Women scheduling their C-sections either before or after so that they would not have a child on 666. Ladies who went into labor trying to somehow put it off the inevitable until the 7th so that it wouldn't be on 666. For we know and understand that 666 is the mark of the Antichrist. And then, of course, um, party from hell enjoys 666. 10,000 bikers descended on hell, Michigan. Impromptu impromptu and uh they uh said what 666 there's something special about that we need to be in hell to celebrate and so they poured in 10,000 horn in on tiny town to celebrate hell amazing how people know about 666 and of course the quote-unquote mark of the antichrist but we've been learning from 1 John that 666 is really not the key to understanding who are the people that represent the Antichrist. But those who represent the Antichrist are those who have bought into, who have accepted, who have embraced a false view of Jesus Christ. And that false view either compromises his deity, the fact that he was God, or compromises his humanity as if he never really came in a human body. And John said, if you really want to know who the Antichrist is, you have to look at their theology. You have to look specifically at their Christology and what do they believe about Jesus Christ. And they believe false doctrine. Particularly in John, that uh, Jesus never really had a physical body. That he was never a real person, but only appeared to be human while he was here on earth. Well, in 2 John, he follows up with a personal letter. A personal letter that uh, we don't know for sure if it was written to a particular woman called the elect lady and her children or her family or whether he was using the term the elect lady as a reference to uh, a local church and uh, the members of that local church whether he was referring to an individual person and her family or to a local church and the congregation it doesn't really change the interpretation of the passage. For John, in this short second epistle, wants to emphasize to this Christian community how important it is that they walk in love. In order to walk in love, they must walk in truth. And in order to walk in the truth, they must understand and have a right concept of who Jesus Christ really is. Open up your Bibles with me, if you will, to 2 John 
chapter 1. There's only one chapter, and beginning at verse 1. John writes, the elder, referring to himself. John was both older in age as an elder. The word can refer to one older in age. Or he could be referring to his status as an elder over the churches. The elder to the chosen lady, the elect lady, and her children, whom I love in truth. And not only I, but also all who know the truth. For the sake of the truth which abides in us and will be with us forever. Yes, love must be according to God's word. Truth abides with us and in us. As believers in Jesus Christ, we are the repositories. We are the guardians of the truth of God's word. As Paul said, God has put this treasure, his treasure, in earthen vessels. And uh, we are those who can love only because we do know the truth. Any emotion, any feeling that is not guarded by, guided by, governed by the truth of God's word is truly not love. It is lust, it is manipulation, it is emotional attachment, it is codependency. We have lots of terms that we could put on it. But love of God only comes from embracing the truth of his word. In 2 John 1 verse 3, John gives a typical but very meaningful uh, greeting. He says, grace, mercy, and peace will be with us. It comes from God the Father and from Jesus Christ. And then in order to define even further, since Jesus Christ has been the source of controversy in his, his personhood, he says, Jesus Christ, the Son of the Father, in truth and in love. D.L. Atkins has a wonderful but brief commentary on this grace mercy, and peace that comes from God. He writes this, John offers a triple blessing, beginning with grace. Grace is God's unmerited and undeserved kindness, which he freely bestows on persons who are unworthy of such attention. It is everything a holy and righteous God does for sinners that they do not deserve. Mercy occurs only here in the entire Johannine corpus. It speaks of God's compassion and pity, his tenderness and his readiness to forgive us our sins. Peace, he says, is a Hebrew concept, emphasizing a wholeness and a well-being of life in all of its aspects. It carries the ideas such as safety and rest, the absence of hostility. Grace is God doing for us what we do not deserve. Mercy is God not doing to us what we do deserve. And peace is God giving us what we need based upon his grace and mercy. The word order is significant. God's grace is always prior. Mercy and peace flow from it. Yes, grace, mercy, and peace will be with us if we are embracing and obeying God the Father and His Son, Jesus Christ. Now look at 1 John, 2 John chapter uh, 1 and verse 4. He says, I was very glad to find some of your children walking in truth, just as we have received commandments to do from the Father. Now, the word some is not an actual word in the original language. It's a translation of uh, the grammar. Uh, there is a thing in grammar called a partitive genitive. It's when you're addressing part of a whole. 
And so as John looked at either this elect lady's family, her children, or as he looked at the local church as a whole, he was very pleased to find some of the children walking in the truth. And of course, um, that's probably a realistic view of life at times. You know, if you have uh, several children, of course you want all of them to walk in the grace and the knowledge and obedience to the Lord Jesus Christ. But that's a challenge, particularly the more that you have. For uh, they grow in different stages. God works in their hearts at different ways, at different times. And some of them will be uh, very compliant children, and others will be very defiant children. And, uh, and John was just thankful to see this uh, family of this elect lady, that there were children who were obeying God and walking in his truth. Uh, this would be true of a local congregation also. You know, at any given time, there are those who are very dedicated, and then there are others who are not so dedicated. There are times, that there are those who are experiencing victory and those who are struggling with defeat. But John wanted to rejoice and focus upon the children that were walking in the truth, those that had received and they were obedient to God's command. Uh, as a pastor to a church or a parent to a child, your desire is not just that some of your children will be walking in the truth, but that all of your children will be walking in the truth. For that is the greatest joy of the Christian heart, to know that uh, one's uh, children, one's congregation, one's flock, are seeking to obey and to follow the Lord Jesus Christ. The greatest legacy that we can leave our children or the next generation in a church is a model of someone or people who love God and demonstrate it by seeking to obey his word. And John hits on something that, as a pastor, was a great delight to him. And that was to look at this church or look at this family and say, I'm so thankful to see people, to see children obeying God's word and walking in the truth. I remember uh, years ago, you remember Mr. Potato Head? You know? Now, if you go way back, you remember Mr. Potato Head when Mr. Potato Head was a potato. Remember, all you got was the potato. You had to supply your own potato. And you would design this uh, potato. You'd put different ears on it and a different hat and maybe some hair and different smiley faces and those kinds of things. Well, of course, then it developed into you got a plastic Mr. Potato Head or a Mrs. Potato Head developed along. Remember that? And you would take this thing and you would want to create something from this object. And that was a, 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 an enjoyable delight. Uh, so it is with children. So it is with a flock. You have a responsibility to take this life, to take this thing, and to the best of your ability to create something that when it's done is in the image of Jesus Christ and that will reflect Jesus Christ. I'm reminded of the words in Psalms 127 when it says, Unless the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain who build it. Unless the Lord guards the city, the watchman keeps awake in vain. It is vain for you to rise up early, to retire late, to eat the bread of painful labors, for God gives to his beloved even in his sleep. Beloved children, behold, children are a gift of the Lord. The fruit of the womb is a reward. Like arrows in the hand of a warrior, so are the children of one's youth. Yes, to, to work and labor uh, uh, and to give and yet not to impart Christ-like values, Christ-like character, is to ultimately give them nothing but the things of the world. Deuteronomy chapter 6 says, These things which I have commanded you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your sons and shall talk of them 
when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise up, you will bind them as signs on your hands. They shall be frontals on your forehead. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. Yes, generational faith to be able to see one's children walking in the truth, whether it's a church or a family, is a source of great satisfaction and joy. Second John verse one, or, uh, chapter 1, verse 5 goes on. Now I ask you, lady, not as though I were writing to you a new commandment, but the one which we have had from the beginning, that we love one another. And this is love, that we walk according to his commandments. This is the commandment, just as you have heard from the beginning, that you should walk in it. The most loving thing that we can do for another person is to grow in the grace and the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ, to obey his word. That is the only true love that is of any value and worth embracing. We must constantly ask ourselves, what is the loving thing to do? Oh, what is the loving thing? To do God's will, to seek God's will in the life of the other person. And so there are times when it's a, a word of great encouragement. Go, go, great, move on. And there's other times when it's stop, don't go there, I'm not going to let you. For it is wrong and it is sin. Yes, love is doing God's will. You remember the words of uh, Jesus when he was asked, Teacher, Matthew twenty-two thirty-six. Teacher, what is the greatest commandment in the law? And uh, Jesus said to him, You shall love the Lord thy God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the great and foremost commandment. The second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend the whole law, the whole prophets, the whole word of God. Yes, if we truly want to be loving people, we must be people who pursue God with loving passion and pursue our neighbors with the same kind of godly love. In verse 7, John goes on, For many deceivers have gone into the world. Those who do not acknowledge Jesus Christ as coming in the flesh. This is the deceiver and the antichrist. We don't have to worry about 666. I celebrated it. I'd been planning that day for 55 years. It was a marvelous day, not one to be feared. I wasn't worried about going to hell, Michigan, or those types of things. It is but a number that will be a mystery during a time of great tribulation when I and all who have faith in Jesus Christ will be removed because of the rapture of the church. It is not God's will that we go through that time. And uh, the deceiver is really one with bad theology. 1 Timothy 2.5 says this, For there is one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. The humanity of Christ is essential to his mission, to his identification with humanity to his mission as the second Adam, overcoming the failures of Adam number one, his demonstration of absolute obedience to God, his return to heaven to represent us to God, to be our great high priest, to be our mediator, to be our compassionate intercessor and advocate against our adversary. You remember when we studied 1 John. 1 John 2, 19 says this, They went out from us because they were really never of us. For had they been of us, they would have remained with us. But they went out so that it could be shown that they were really not of us. Within the early church, there were many deceivers, many false teachers. Paul warns us in Timothy, but the Spirit expressly states that in the latter times, some will fall away from the truth. From the faith, paying attention to deceitful spirits and doctrines of demons. 
by means of the hypocrisy of liars, seared in their own conscience as with a branding iron. Men will forbid marriage, advocate abstaining from foods which God has created to be gratefully shared uh, by those who believe and know the truth. For everything created by God is good. Nothing is to be rejected if it is received with gratitude. For it is sanctified by the means of the word of God in prayer. Paul says, Timothy, in pointing these things out to the brethren, you will be a good servant of Christ Jesus, constantly nourished on the words of faith and of sound doctrine, which you have been following along. Yes, since the death of Jesus Christ and his resurrection, uh, Satan has sought to destroy his identity through false doctrine, through Mormonism today, through Christian science today, through the Jehovah's Witnesses, through Scientology, through uh, 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 Christian um, science and others. Uh, there are literally thousands upon thousands of cults and deviations uh, that will try to uh, change the simple character and identity of Jesus Christ, the God-man. And any compromise of that is a compromise leading to damnation. Colossians 2.8 says this. In warning, Paul says, See to it that no one takes you captive through philosophy and deception, according to the tradition of men, according to the elementary principles of the world, rather than according to Christ. For in Christ all the fullness of deity dwells in what? In bodily Form, and him you, and in him you have been made complete, and he is the head over all rule and authority. Religions today, cults today, philosophies today, they love to take a little bit of Jesus Christ. They love to take a little bit of Christianity and mix it up into deception and error so that they can lead people astray. In uh, verse 8, John said, Watch yourselves, guard yourselves, that you do not lose or that you destroy what has been accomplished, but that you may receive a full reward. As believers in Jesus Christ, we need to watch ourselves. We need to guard the truth. We need to hold on to the Word of God. For if we begin to compromise the Word of God, we will begin to destroy the very good things that have been accomplished. And ultimately, we could lose the reward factor. Let us understand this. Salvation is assured, but rewards are not. In 1 Corinthians 3.11... Paul said this, For no man can lay a foundation other than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now if a man builds on a foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, and straw, each man's work will become evident, for the day will show it, because it will be revealed with fire. And the fire itself will test the quality of each person's work. If any man's work which he is built on remains, he shall receive a reward. But if any man's work is burned up, he will suffer loss. But he himself will be saved, yet so as through fire. Our salvation is assured, but not our rewards. Not our place of honor or opportunity in heaven. And how sad it would be for a person to embrace Christ as Savior and not learn to follow and serve him as Lord. It would be as sad as a person, let's say, who developed their own business. They were an entrepreneur, and they started uh, their own business, and they worked it for years, and they poured their life into it, morning, noon, and night, being totally consumed with it, only to go bankrupt and have nothing in the end. Or a, a person who was uh, so uh, devoted uh, to a corporation that they neglected other aspects of life 
and found that at retirement they had no health, they had no strength, they had no life left to enjoy or to serve God with. We need to guard our spiritual eyes. We need to guard the spiritual truth so that we do not destroy what we have accomplished. We need to finish strong in a godly and Christ-like way. Verse 9 of 2 John. He says, Anyone who goes too far and does not abide in the teachings of Christ does not have God. The one who abides in the teaching, he has both the Father and the Son. We need to abide in the truth of the triunity also. Even though Holy Spirit is not mentioned here, we clearly see the deity of the Father and the deity of the Son. And unfortunately today, there are many oneness groups out there, oneness Baptists, oneness Pentecostals, oneness Assembly of God. Generally speaking, if somebody's got oneness in their title, it means they do not hold to the Trinity. And that's a serious loss of good theology. Uh, you cannot have the Father without having the Son. You can't have the Son without having the Father. 2 Peter 3.17 says this, You therefore, beloved, knowing this beforehand, be on your guard so that you are not carried away by the error of unprincipled men, and you fall away from your own steadfastness, but grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be the glory both now and to the day of eternity. Amen. Verse 10, If anyone comes to you and does not bring this teaching... Do not receive him into your house, and do not give him a greeting. For the one who gives him a greeting participates in his evil deeds. Now, we need to understand that in ancient Near Eastern history, hospitality was uh, just very, very important, and it was culturally required. Uh, you know, today we enjoy having uh, someone come and visit us for maybe three days, you know. <laughs> it's uh, that old adage like uh, the Spanish Proverbs. Uh, what does a fish and a visitor have in common? They both stink after three days, right? And, uh, uh, but uh, hospitality uh, was something that was absolutely vital in those days. And uh, it was important Christian ministry for people needed a place of safety, a place of wholesomeness. And so when an itinerant uh, preacher or teacher uh, would come, uh, you were required culturally to open up your home and to provide for them for up to three days. You remember what Jesus said to the disciples in Matthew 10, giving us a cultural illustration. He said to them, Do not acquire gold or silver or copper for your money belts, or a bag for your journey, or even two coats or sandals or a staff, for the worker is worthy of his support. Whatever city or village you enter, inquire who is worthy in it, and stay at his home until you leave that city. As you enter the house, give it a blessing. If the house is worthy, give it a blessing of peace. But if it is not worthy, take your blessing of peace. Whosoever does not receive you, nor heed your words as you go out from that house or that city, simply shake the dust off of your feet. Yes, we need to maintain a sense of moral and theological purity. The story is told of the uh, Apostle John, who wrote uh, our first, second, and third John, and the book of uh, Revelation, as well as the Gospel of John. In John's day, there was a heretic by the name of Serenthus, and he had compromised the character of Jesus Christ by denying that Jesus Christ had come in the flesh. And uh, Polycarp, who was a disciple of John, tells this story how uh, John was at one of the uh, public... Um, uh, baths, public health clubs, 
And uh, somebody came and told the Apostle John that uh, Serenthus had entered into the building and was going to be there. And uh, John said, I must leave immediately. I don't want to be in this building for fear God's judgment comes down and falls upon it. All too often we find ourselves um, uh, embracing uh, people, even encouraging people uh, who are involved in false doctrine, and we need to be careful. John says, if anyone comes to you and does not bring this teaching, I know of churches who have allowed uh, Mormon missionaries and Jehovah's Witness missionaries to come and participate in services among them. And all they were doing was look, looking for proselytes, looking for opportunity to grab on to those who were weak and to uh, take them out. This is unacceptable. On the other hand, this verse is not teaching that we should not embrace them in debate. Back then, to welcome a person into your home <clears throat> was to put them up for the night, to provide for them. To send them on their way with a blessing was to say that you agree with their ministry and that you're praying for them. So we need a balance here in uh, relationship to those that have false doctrine. Uh, I'm willing to have someone into my home for the purpose of debate and discussion, of trying to share with them the word of God, share with them the truth of Jesus Christ, but I don't plan on putting them up for the night. I don't plan on giving them a meal and sending them on to the next neighbor. And so I think uh, at times we need to have a balance. I'm sure that many of you at work, in the marketplace, you have people who are uh, from these different cults, and they are in your workplace. You don't have to shun them. You don't have to avoid them. You need to evangelize them. And I think uh, John would affirm that. In this verses 10 and 11, he's talking about those who would provide aid and support and encouragement, and we certainly do not want to do that. Uh, verse 12 of uh, 2 John, he says, Though I have many things to write to you, I do not want to do so with paper and ink. Paper and ink uh, was a second form, a lesser form of communication, and John wanted to speak to them face to face. Now, next week when we study 3 John, we're going to find he was having some problems with his paper and ink. He would send a letter to certain churches, and there were certain people, certain leaders in the church that would say, no, 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 we're not going to read John's letters. And they were putting him off. He says, I hope to come to you and speak face to face so that your joy may be made full. The children of your chosen sister greet you. John wants the church. John wants each home and family to be a godly family. But it can only be a godly family if the leaders of the church, the people of the church, the parents of the family, the family is committed to a loving, truthful relationship in obedience to God's word. John would say to the churches today, what kind of a church are you? Are you a church that embraces my word? Are you a church that believes and obeys my word? All too often, churches today want to pick and choose. Don't like that chapter. Don't like that chapter. Let's reinterpret that chapter. Put that one aside. Unacceptable. You believe all of it, and you obey all of it. Uh, what kind of a family do we want to have? Moms and dads, are you leaving your children a legacy of devotion to God and obedience to his word? Are you striving, are you seeking to do his good will? We need to guard the truth and not compromise. We also need to be prepared to evangelize. We don't want to be a... We need to guard the truth and not compromise. We also need to be prepared to evangelize. 
We don't want to be afraid to embrace and engage these people in discussion and conversation. It's very simple how to confront them and to try to help them uh, to understand the absolute truth of God's word. I remember some uh, years ago sitting down with a Jehovah's Witness uh, and uh, they brought in uh, a, uh, an elder or two of the congregation and uh, I asked them a simple question. I said, what do I have to do to get to heaven? And they gave me a five to seven step program. And I said to them, you mean, okay, so in order for me to get to heaven, these are all the works that I need to do. Yes, yes, yes. So just so I know that we're certain on this, <clears throat> these are the steps, these are the works that I have. So just so I know that we're certain on this, <clears throat> these are the steps, these are the works that I have to do so that I could go to heaven. Yes, that's exactly right. Can I borrow your Bible? I borrowed their Bible. I went to Ephesians. It's not by works of righteousness, which we have done. They jumped up and they yelled at me, you tricked me. I didn't trick you. I gave you every opportunity to tell me how to get to heaven, and then I read your Bible, which says it's not by works of righteousness, which we have done. For by grace you are saved through faith, and this is what? Not of yourselves. Not of yourselves. And we need to share that message with them, that salvation comes by grace, through faith, in the mediator, the God-man, Jesus Christ. Well, today we have a wonderful uh, privilege and opportunity of uh, dedicating and commissioning our uh, youth mission team uh, for their trip. They will leave this next Friday. And uh, they will be gone uh, for eight days. And so um, I'd like to uh, have uh, those that are participating in the youth mission team come up. I'd also like to have the uh, ushers that uh, are going to be taking the offering to prepare. And uh, we will take our morning offering and then we will have a time of uh, dedication for the uh, young people and uh, adults that are going along. So if you are going on the mission uh, trip, come on up and just sit up here in the front row for me. We have, I believe, 17 in total that are going. So... All right, let's pray for our uh, morning offering, and then we'll have this time of dedication. Father in heaven, we thank you for the way that you have uh, blessed us, and we continue to pray for those that need uh, full-time work amongst us. Uh, we do pray that you would open up those uh, job and career opportunities in spite of this uh, difficult economy. Father, we pray for those that are weak amongst us, both physically and and uh, spiritually. We thank you for the answers to prayer that we have heard, but we pray that you would continue to uh, strengthen us. Father, put a hedge of protection around our children in particular and our families that we might uh, be strong in the Lord. Help us to cast our care on you. We think about uh, Smith in particular. Be with Tim and Sharon and the other brothers and sisters as they uh, seek to understand what has put her in this coma. Uh, we do pray that you'd give the doctors wisdom in their diagnosis. We pray for our president as uh, he continues to face such uh, challenging uh, international and national uh, troubles. We ask that you would just give him wisdom. We pray this all now and thank you for this uh, offering which we give to you in Jesus' name. Amen.